Letters to Lisa, Compilation 2, Recording 1, The Men in the Monument. Sorry, it's been a while. I went on holiday, then I had to take Dougal to the vet. He's fine. Turns out he was faking having a limp for attention. <laughs> Little rascal. Right, I've decided that I won't stop these recordings, as they might help someone somewhere. Well, not that I apparently have much choice, unless I like to get pestered by letters. This one I found under a stack of holiday brochures I was going to throw out. It might have arrived before any of the other letters, as that stack of brochures have been there a while. It's a fairly odd letter as well, yellowed and with a lot of forwarding addresses written on it. It felt almost wrong to open it, as though it's been in this state for so long. To actually read it would be destroying an artefact or museum piece. Here it is. Lisa, I must confide in you. I haven't been the most sane version of myself recently. I've struggled with the visions. The dreams have been getting dimmer with each passing day, but I fear that this does not mean the end of them. On the contrary, I worry that this means the cause of these vile visuals will return, something I hoped would never happen again. Since it has been quite some time since we last saw one another, I shall explain as you may have forgotten us. I know we could never forget you. You were always too dazzling to be dimmed in our minds. We met on a Wednesday. In spring, a mild, damp day. It was a delightfully quiet morning, and I had been taken with the urge to stroll through my local park. That's when I met you pacing the small square, causing the pigeons to take flight. I dipped my hat and tried to avoid your eyes as I passed, believing you to be some sort of mad woman. However, as I went to move around your panicked movements, I slipped on a considerably large amount of pigeon excrement, landing in a fairly undignified fashion flat on the pavement. Being the delight that you are, you held out a hand to assist me. I looked at it and rather rudely, I might add, dismissed it quickly, desperate not to interact with you. With great difficulty, I pushed myself up and off the ground. You gave that small smile of yours and apologised through a fit of giggles. Your childish nature put me at ease as I brushed myself down. Well, that was until your coat began to make a strange shouting sound, distinctly inhuman, but certainly not of an animal I had heard before. I stood in fear as you produced a small compact mirror, which appeared to glow and images appeared upon it. You grew impatient and aggravated with it, and spun as the shouting from the mirror began to speed up. You pointed the small item towards the monument to our fallen soldiers in the centre of the park. Moving towards it, the shouting became faster and louder. It filled me with much discomfort. For a rainy Wednesday morning, it was rather a lot for a merely retired Redditch accountant. I would have left if I had an iota of sense in my head. I would have muttered a polite apology and scarpered. However, I was rooted to the spot so concerned with the actions in front of me, I should have gone. I knew that when you leaned towards the small obelisk and tapped it several times, although it was clearly, very clearly, and had been for years made of solid stone, there came a small tapping in response to yours, as though inside it was secreted something, something capable of call and response. I remember staring at you, hoping to see that you were equally concerned by this. However, the manic grin you flashed back at me told me otherwise. Putting away the screaming mirror, you took out a small crowbar from somewhere a woman shouldn't put things. As though in a matter-of-fact way, you told me that, Oh, <laughs> I thought I'd lost it. Unaware of what you were referring to, I nodded. I couldn't move. It was embarrassing. All I could do was stand there and witness the bizarreness. I was brought out of my frozen state as you struck the obelisk. Oh, uh, hang on a tick, I tried. However, your blows were passing through the object faster than I believed possible. Within the structure was a small being the size of a hamster. At first I thought that's what it was. However, 
As you picked it up, it appeared to be a man, a human male, the height of a Gideon's Bible. He seemed angry and unhappy to be manhandled, so to speak. Where is it? You said quietly to the small man. He scowled and crossed his matchstick-sized arms. Look, I'm being nice about this, okay? You're the one who stole from me. He turned away from her with the stubbornness of a toddler. <laughs> well, if you're going to be like that, you said, turning to me, causing me to remember that I wasn't merely observing this confusing scene. I was also physically there. You handed me the tiny man. I instinctively took the small fellow before I could realise I didn't wish to continue to be a part of this. However, you had already turned back to the monument. Climbing inside, you picked up various items that had no business being on this planet, let alone in an obelisk in memory of our fallen men. Um, uh, excuse me, I began, finally finding my voice again. Ah, here it is. You bent down and picked up a small white item that looked like a malformed pencil. I know you scavenge technology, but it's a bugger to find these things on this side of the 21st century. She bent down to talk to the man, who was kicking at my palm in anger. It did nothing more than tickle me somewhat. I'll pop you back just after I check if it still works. She pulled the mirror out again, stopping its screams. She proceeded to pop the small pencil into her ear. There was a pause. <laughs> Oh, yes. Oh, thank you, space. You yelled. And pop him back in his little house, will you? You said to me. I did so obligingly, dropping the small fellow carefully back into the interior of the obelisk. It was truly amazing. The inside appeared to be some sort of tiny repair house. Workbenches fit for a doll's house lined the walls, and there seemed to be a few other short fellows working on what appeared to be pigeons. Taking a closer look, they appeared to be working on inner wirings of the creatures. Before I could examine closer, you pulled me back. We watched as various pigeons landed on the damaged monument, all excreting what appeared to be cement at a shocking speed. There was a flurry, and the birds dispersed, and the monument was back as it had been before. D -d 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 I began. Oh, yes, it's very confusing, but if you're free, I could explain over tea, you asked. I agreed without question, as any man would kick themselves if they didn't follow this trail of oddness. So, over tea, well, rather a lot of tea, you told me tales of your incredibly insane exploits. If you'd done so prior to the incident in the park, you'd have been in a padded cell for certain. It all seemed so wonderful and weird to me. It lifted my spirits to know that there was so much more to the drab world around me than I was aware of. You had to run off to an emergency with a string ghost or something similar. I was so sorry to be saying goodbye to you so quickly. However, you left me in great spirits for the rest of the day. As I wandered on home, I watched as the budding flowers swayed and the insect fitted about, finding my street. I whistled, which I hadn't done since the end of the war. <laughs> I almost skipped. That was until upon opening my gate, I was greeted by a murder of crows, a handful of stray cats and a kit of pigeons. The air was almost sucked from my lungs with the shock. I slowly backed away, knowing there was little chance of escape. I turned on my heel and ran. Down the street, I noticed squirrels were beginning to gather. Look, it, it wasn't me! I skidded round the corner and I nearly fell over a woman with a pram. She scowled at me. I lifted my hat to her. A fatal mistake as a cat landed its outstretched claws squarely into my scalp. She reeled back as I shouted with pain. Please, I didn't do anything! I continued. A panicked housewife slapped the cat from me, apologising profusely and taking the feral being with her. From that moment on, I've had visions of small creatures attacking me. They were initially highly violent, with my tongue being ripped from my gaping mouth in the first few ones. I didn't sleep for a whole week, gaining the title of Mr. Panic in the post office whenever I posted a letter. I told no one of this, of course. It wouldn't do to tell others of the sweat-inducing dreams of small animals tearing their eyes from my sockets. After a week, however... The dreams became less intense. 
A week after the incident, animals I passed seemed friendlier and more obliging to me. It did not help with the dreams, however. These visions, as I've said, have begun to fade. Is this good, or does this mean something else is set to happen? I cannot sit easily until I know for sure. I found your contacts in the local records. I'm not sure if you are still living at this address, but I must find out what all this means. I know you would know instantly. Please respond to me with haste. I wait for your letter with eagerness. Yours sincerely, Wilfred Hancock. Well, I never liked pigeons. They've been leaving rather nasty surprises for me on the bird table for quite some time. However, I've never had anything as horrific as this happen, thank God. I'm sorry, Wilfred. I, I don't think this was me. It sounds nothing like me. Well, I, I mean, if this letter did reach me, it must be for me in some way. I hope that you weren't plagued by bad dreams after you sent this letter. I hope that the small men in the monument leave you alone. That was Recording One, The Men in the Monument, written by Phoebe Critchlow, read by Caroline Laurie.